Okay, I think you can hear me well. Right. Thank you very much. Sorry for the delay uh, because of the rain and the weather conditions at the airport. And some colleagues still could not make it. <laughs> Hopefully we will meet them uh, sometime before the welcome cocktail. Uh, I don't know how to start. I think this is working. Let's see. Yes, okay. So we had a conference seven months ago in Bodrum, and in a short time we managed to make this conference with the support of session organizers and many colleagues from many different countries. So I owe a lot of gratitude to my uh, colleagues who accepted our invitations as plenary and our plenary speakers. Also invited speakers. Uh, I don't know the real numbers, but I think we expect to be around 450 or to 500 participants um, in the form of invited uh, oral presentations and poster presentations together during the six days. The weather seemed to be uh, cloudy and rainy for the next two days, but from Sunday I think we will have sunny days. And I hope you will also enjoy the environment and the climate. The water temperature will still be cold, but I think for Russians it's okay. We have some Russian colleagues, yes. Uh, it, it can be manageable, I, mean, I did manage it. Uh, I tested, so <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we will be running in six parallel sessions uh, from tomorrow afternoon. Uh, on Saturday, our colleague Alexander Golubov, I don't know whether he is around. Uh, we placed a seventh parallel session for superconducting spintronics for Saturday, so we will be in seven parallel sessions. For the rest of the other days for the conference, we will be in six parallel sessions. Uh, for those who will be coming for the first time, uh, normally we make this opening ceremony with public outreach, but uh, we don't have public because of general elections and we don't want to be a party to any of the <laughs> uh, campaigns that are uh, going on in about 10 days. So we will be making academic presentations uh, as plenary. So I'm not a plenary because I am the main organizer, so I cannot put myself as a plenary speaker, so in the program you will see as a contributor. Uh, and my topic is not very scientific, it's just a collection of data available uh, on the media, with uh, focus on uh, the recently uh, becoming popular emerging quantum technologies, and we have real experts here, and Professor Irfan Siddiqui and Professor Roland Wiesendanger from Germany. They are the world leading speakers, and I'm sure you will have more uh, insight from their lectures. I will give you just a general statistics, and for a country with Turkey's scale, whether we could be in the lead with the emerging technologies if we make an enough investment and also uh, increase the manpower, which is maybe more important than the money investment itself. Okay, uh, so sustainable development is very crucial for any country. Having uh, 
mines and many other natural resources will run out one day. But if you have a sustainable development on a, a advanced technology and you can survive in the shortage of many supplies like the one after pandemic in the whole world and all the economies including Turkey have some kind of setbacks after the pandemic so we are all going through some difficult times, even in the most advanced countries like USA or Japan, Germany. Okay, uh, let's move on to my presentation. Uh, I usually start with this slide, and this is the uh, levitation of a permanent magnet on a superconductor when it is cooled. Okay, I don't know this laser pointer. Okay, this one, right, working. <coughs> so we all know this, I'm not going into details. Uh, just give you outline for what I'm going to say. I'm not very organized with the presentation because of the organizational duties over the few days, but um, I will focus on superconductivity and we have Professor Joel Miller as a uh, plenary speaker today as a last one. He will give you more insight on magnetism area, so I will just give you a brief overview of superconductivity, which will um, still occupying the minds of the whole world in the superconductive area. Uh, so there are some driving forces <coughs> for superconductivity, like CERN, ITER, and MAGLEV uh, mega projects. Let's say, okay. So industry. Now we're talking about industry 4.0, uh, maybe 5.0, with the artificial intelligence and other uh, involvements of technology. But, okay, we will go through this in more detail. I mean, if you look at the history of technology from if it is well known, about 10,000 before Christ, let's say. Uh, so we see agricultural revolution, pottery, invention of plow irrigation, and metallurgy, writing, mathematics. And you see, this is a uh, rapid increase increase of the developments in the last century. Uh, you can see Genom project and landing on the moon in 1968. And there are many mobile phones, internet, nuclear energy and DNA discovered. So these are the milestones of the last century. And so, the birth of quantum physics or quantum mechanics uh, relies on the inability of classical physics to address some of the issues at the uh, subatomic scale for the behavior of electrons or protons, neutrons. And because of quantized nature of uh, subatomic particles where the classical physics cannot give you the deterministic answers. So quantum mechanics, mechanics is based on uh, 
the prob probability statistics mainly. And with the most recently advanced uh, entanglement issue, and it is becoming more and more possible to use with conductivity uh, for quantum computation. And this is one of the niche applications of superconductors. And it may not be that possible uh, to apply it all, and you have errors involved in the computations, and error mitigation is a very critical issue. And Professor Irfan Siddiqui will give you more detailed lecture uh, about this, so I'm not going into details, just to give you uh, what is happening <laughs> with the quantum technologies, investment, and funding, and the manpower, which is more important, uh, in all the countries involved in this race. Okay, let's go to... So we all know about what has happened in the last century. Most of the critical uh, developments on the uh, photoelectric effect, or even before Max Planck, uh, black body radiation started in 1900. And they all involved Nobel Prizes in the past. And uh, it looks like quantum technologies will keep the whole scientific community plus the funding agencies together with industry uh, may be more, more and more busy as time gets by. Because the conventional technology we have today uh, has become less and less uh, being able to meet the demand for computation and for other issues. So it looks like that the quantum technologies will probably, when it becomes available to all uh, society, the current technologies will be destructive. So uh, it, it may be possible that the countries advancing these technologies will be one side and the rest of them will be other side. So there will be nothing between these two. This is my uh, understanding. Okay, I'm not going into detail. So what about Turkey and the world is doing in terms of general science? in terms of publications. Um, and for Turkey, scientific publication with Turkey was addressed in the paper for the first time in history is 1952. So before 1952, uh, we did not have any scientific publications in Science Citation Index. Okay? Um, so, these are the dates available on the internet in the web of science. Uh, so let's have a look at the number of publications in blue. The scale is on the, on the left for the whole world. It's always increasing from 1945 to date, and we we'll probably see the effects of pandemic in 2022, and we have a drop in the total number of publications. And this is Turkey. So the scale is on the right hand side. So the, these are thousands and these are millions. So you can just have a look at that. Um, Overall, we have about 3 
three and a half million papers published every year in all disciplines of science. Okay? So, what about the number of publications, science categories, and these are the shares, I think the electrical engineering, electrical or uh, and electronic engineering is the uh, most uh, large part of it, biochemistry, sorry, I think I made a mistake. Um, so, th these are the distribution of the papers uh, which was published in this area. So this is the ranking of countries in this uh, range from 1945 to date. And USA is still leading. China is the second. And Turkey now is ranking 19. Uh, these are just the numbers, not the uh, comparison of scientific quality or anything else. But this is the average for the long range from 45 to date. If you look at most recent data, I think China is doing more than USA, it's maybe ranking the first. <coughs> So these are the number of projects funded in the world. And you can see China uh, funding agency is ranking first uh, with the number of projects funded. But for USA case, I think we have more than one funding agency, so we need to add them up. And European Commission is somewhere there. And this is just going like that. And Turkey, and the main funding agency, Tipitak, is we have in thousands. It's 54,000 projects supported in the last uh, more than 50 years now. Okay. Uh, so if you make the dates closer, uh, the numbers will change, and this is uh, USA, now dropping over the last five or six years. And China is overpassing. And Turkey is somewhere here. Uh, and so these are the, because 2023 is not complete year now, these are the just current values for the papers. Okay, let's have a look at the quantum science and technology uh, web of science categories. Uh, this can go back to 1965. On average we have about, uh, well there is the effect of pandemic here, so uh, what, I, mean, I think on average, we probably have 4,500 publications each year in this category. Okay. It's not big. Maybe if you use superconductivity keywords, you probably have something about 7,000. Uh, but, okay. Uh, so these are the number of publications in this category. And ranking of countries, and Turkey is not doing very well. That's 27th position. Okay, let's have a look at, again, the uh, funding of the projects. You see that China is the first one, and NSF from U US and UK, Russian, that is, the European Commission goes like this. Okay, I will probably draw your attention to this uh, slide here. And it looks like as of the last few months, 
overall uh, investment in the whole world in quantum science and technology area is about 36 billion. And within a few years, it is expected to be about 42 billion. And Africa and Middle East, including Turkey, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough investment in quantum science and technology. But I know there are a few main projects in Turkey just started a few months ago uh, on quantum radar applications. Uh, I think the main country making investment on quantum science and technologies is China at the moment, about 15 million dollars. And one whole campus, Haifa, is devoted to quantum science and technology. And also China is making investment on superconducting technologies other than quantum technologies. Um, so these are the subject areas of quantum science and technology areas. And the, for superconductivity, we are mostly focused on uh, quantum computing. And so uh, simulation in life sciences, financial services, and there are lots of uh, possible areas of impact that uh, quantum technologies can make in the next decade to come. Okay, uh, so we all know the superconductivity, but I will just mention briefly about the possible uh, problems. And Professor Ahmed Kweil is here. I think he knows more about <laughs> large-scale applications of superconductors, including uh, coded conductors developments. Uh, so he has a plenary lecture soon. Uh, the, the need to cool down superconductors is a real issue. And the cost of cooling and the benefit we get when we cool them to low temperatures is sometimes a, a trade-off. <laughs> and depending on the type of superconductivity we engage with. And the established market is mostly based on conventional superconductors like niobium type or niobium tritium. And, and this technology is, is, is mostly in, in, in the MRI market. And about 10% of the MRI market is superconductivity market, let's say. And this is not a big issue these days. Maybe we can talk about a couple of hundred million dollars per year. And so, but the fusion uh, issue, and Professor Suzanne Sipeller and Amit Goya will be addressing in the plenary lectures, is becoming more and more promising to the needs uh, of energy demands uh, in, the, in the whole world, let's say. So these are the possible applications of superconductors and there are some progresses. Hopefully we will be able to learn more during the conference about the advances and challenges that we still face in this area. Okay, CERN is a still big user of superconductivity because there is a FCC program and probably they will still use uh, low temperature superconductors for the uh, accelerator, future circular accelerator. Um, and this is also a driving force superconductivity research. Um, and NGB2 is also a possible candidate for future FTA 
uh, some technical issues uh, overcome. Okay, and this is a Japanese superconducting maglev. Uh, I'm sure all of us know about the details. And still, low temperature superconductors like niobium tire is being used as a permanent magnet coil to suspend the whole train during the transportation. And because of climate uh, change issues, and this kind of transportation is favorable because it makes low carbon emissions compared to uh, other transports, including uh, freight uh, transport. Uh, okay, let's have a look at it. So another one is the ITER, the experimental reactor. It's a highly international mega project. Um, it's not going to be a reactor eventually, but it's uh, meeting the needs of uh, skilled manpower in the collaborating countries. And Turkey is unfortunately not part of this project yet. Uh, hopefully this project will become successful maybe in the last uh, few years and it will probably start, uh, become more successful by 2030, I think, as they aim to get the, the issues. So we, we will be also learning more about these issues from the uh, international colleagues. So I will just briefly mention Correlation of energy consumption and GDP per person. This is a measure of how uh, a country is developed technologically. So if you are using more energy, electricity energy, say it seems that you are uh, more developed. The figures may not be correct, but um, if you go like this, you probably see the most advanced countries in technology. As you go down, like Ethiopia, Niger, and in the African countries, you consume less electricity and you are less developed. And Turkey is somewhere in between here. And, and these are the nuclear uh, reactors for countries. And some countries are stopped using nuclear energy, like Germany, they stop nuclear powers. Uh, but Turkey has only one nuclear power, it's still not operational, but it's about to complete soon. So this is Coal consumption is not very good for climate change. Uh, and especially in Asia, and more countries are using uh, coal for the energy. And the greener countries like Europe and developed countries are using uh, less and less coal. You can see the drop of percentage from uh, 1980 to 2010. And okay, I think we can move this slide, okay. And in 2000, Turkey's ranking in, in the world economy is 17th. In 2007, it's again 17, then 18, 20, and uh, I think 19, okay? Uh, this is 2020, and after the pandemic, we don't know the results yet. Okay, every country is doing 
investment in this industry for zero. And there are historical developments and I'm not going to go into detail uh, because uh, this is beyond the scope of my presentation, but there is a timeline. Uh, it looks promising that superconductivity could be also used in the uh, internet communication or internet things uh, with wide band possibilities. Uh, this is another potential application of superconductivity. So I'm not going to go into details, but okay. We also need smart society to cope with industry for Caesar, and you need to have skilled society to deal with this uh, new technologies to come. And this is uh, what we meet, need most as Turkey compared to many advanced uh, countries. Okay, uh, I think this is probably for uh, people who deal with economy. <laughs> and I think whatever you do, even you create the most advanced product, you need to disseminate this to the society and the society must be ready to use it. So this is kind of a chicken and egg problem, so you need to have interaction with the, uh, the users of the technology. So, it is very important how much people you can disseminate your product to. And you can make uh, explanation of the technical details at the level of the user the potential user. Right? So, these are the potential uh, applications we have already witnessed over the last decade, and these are uh, the very good examples as successful applications. Okay, uh, so time to reach 10, <laughs> so 100 million customers. It, it was 75 years when the telephone was first discovered over uh, 100 years ago, let's say. And when it took seven years, Facebook four years and Instagram two years. <laughs> so, okay, uh, so I'll skip this one. Uh, so the technology has an impact on economy business is national and global. I mean, it cannot be national only. And it must involve society, also the individual. Yes, okay. Well, I will summarize this. Sorry, I, I should have done better, but I, I think I was only able to do this far. We have some tools. The most basic elements of sustainable development uh, will be based on progress in science and technology and low commerce and industrialization. If one of them is missing, you are missing the whole. <laughs> um, so the, the number of researchers in Turkey uh, must increase at least three times. I'm not talking about the quality, but the numbers. Uh, to meet the level of average OECD countries. And also, the funding must be increased, but uh, this also could be three times more than what we have. But increasing the funding is not enough. You need to do uh, some regulations that the scientists would be happy to run the project or submit the project. If you do not have uh, the procedures 
that people are not happy to deal with for the project. Uh, you spend more time on the side work of the project rather than the scientific part. And this must also be uh, dealt with, I think. And for technology development, I mean, you can be very good at science, like uh, in fundamental health science, but this is not enough. You must have an ecosystem. The industry will be happy to collaborate with the academia to have joint projects. Because industry needs a skilled person and academia cannot train that skilled person for the needs of industry. Then there is a problem. So you have a skilled person and the skilled person will not be happy to stay in Turkey. They prefer to go abroad. It is good for them to go if they come back. And for them to come back, you must have a program to run for them to come back and be part of the advanced countries. I think this is uh, still a problematic issue in Turkey. Uh, also, the educational programs at the high school and even in the elementary school must involve potential quantum technologies. I mean, most of the quantum technologies that we hope we can have it in the next 10 years may not realize, but some of them has already uh, been demonstrated. So they can hopefully be uh, useful uh, for the mankind in the near term. Uh, so these are the, uh, sorry, the, these are the general issues uh, I'd like to share with you as an opening <laughs> speech. It's not scientific, but it's my understanding for today. Thank you very much. this uh, global view of, of quantum and energy applications for superconductors in the 4.0, disruptive events in technology which cause huge changes in the economy, and these great thoughts that you gave at the end. So I guess we can have um, any question or comment to anybody. Yes. Yes. But uh, just I want to ask you the, the we have the, the pro problem with uh, the science, academy and the politics. Yes. How do you consider about this one? It's a, I think global problem we have. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Uh, if we need science, we can buy. This is the perception in politics. And how to overcome this problem? We need to have an interface with the politicians, the decision makers. And I have been running this conference for the last 15 years. And I had invited many ministers, many governors in the opening ceremonies. First time this year, it overlap with the general elections. It do not. It doesn't look like an election campaign. It's like a big fight. <laughs> so I didn't want to be part of any side when inviting one of them and not inviting the other. Uh, but 
we live in a democratic society. I think the democracy we should keep. So we need to have uh, fair elections in every country. And we need people who believe in science as politicians. Thank you. Okay. Miguel Alario Franco from the University of Complutense in Madrid, Spain. Well, we, we have, everybody has a problem between academia and politicians, research and politicians. But our example, the example of Spain in the 80s, is that for the first time we have in the government a solid state physicist, theoretician, and the Secretary of State was a solid state physicist, experimental. And they both did an enormous effort and convinced the government to, to help research. And, and that was a big change. We were, uh, salaries were doubled, re, uh, uh, invest, investment in research was increased progressively, but very much indeed. And the ambience was improving in the, in the sense that society was becoming aware of the interest of science. So I think that one possible way to help in that direction is to have scientists working within the government and with the politicians. That's what we, for us, that was really very, very good. But just to give an example, my salary as a professor was double. You know, double. <laughs> Maybe I just make one small contribution, uh, if I may, as a tennis friend. As scientists, we cannot, we cannot do any development by ourselves. We must interact with the politicians and we try to persuade them. We try to explain, for example, advanced North Korea, Singapore, some other countries who believed in science and they made good progress. I mean, we must consistently interact with the politicians. We cannot just you know, turn our back and do our experiments in the laboratory. So we must always push them. <laughs> and they, when they see in your laboratory something, you must invite them to see your experiments and to see your results. And they don't like reading many long pages of reports, maybe short reports they will understand and make very highlighted outcomes for the research you are doing with the whole world. And I think this, this probably have an impact in Turkey, but in other countries, maybe some other Factors may be more important. Dennis, I think, is asking for somebody else. Hello. Okay, it's working. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. Uh, maybe a small suggestion for your slide number two with uh, okay. the history of technology. Yeah, uh, this is from internet, in fact. It's not my. Yes. Uh, I will come back. <laughs> Number two, yes. Um, so my point is that around 8,000, 9,000 BC, so before pottery, mm -hmm. maybe you should include also about uh, the technology of building materials. This is a time when the mud bricks were invented. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, I will just put the slide on and maybe... Thank you for your contribution. Yes. So somewhere here, yes? Oh. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, that is here. <coughs> okay, I have a little comment about the politicians. Yes. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson identified the biggest problem with America and early democracy is that they had re-election. He said, I could not prevent them from making, allowing the president to be re-elected. 
he claimed that the biggest problem with politicians was that re-election introduces conflicts of interest. So his essential prescription was simply not to have re-elections, to have only single terms everywhere. So single elections forever. Huh? No, no. <laughs> Single term. He wanted a single term. term. Okay, yes. Single term. Yes. yes. But, but that was actually not the reason I raised my hand. I, I wanted to comment on the other slide you had, which was similar to this one, but it was about energy versus GDP. Could you could you flip to it, please? Okay. Uh, I must go fast. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, Let's go I, yes. yes. Okay. Now, uh, if I see correctly, in order to get the last 20% uh, of GDP, you need to have something like a factor of four in energy consumption. Yes. And uh, uh, this actually suggests that the, the best place to be in this curve is somewhere around this inflection point. Somewhere here, yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's, I think, another thought when countries compare to each other. Uh, uh, usually we think that bigger is better, but maybe not always, okay? <laughs> okay, so. Okay, thank you, yes. If this is the only comment I think you made, okay. Are there any questions? Okay, let's, thanks to you. Uh, Director Aligenja. Okay, I, it is my signature, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.